Good afternoon. Looks like we have some people joining us. We'll give it just a, a couple minutes here in case folks are tuning in um, a little bit late, but we'll get rolling here in just a minute or so. Oh, looks like we have somebody from New Jersey tuning in. Uh, feel free in our chat um, pod there to share where you're from. It's always interesting to see um, where folks are coming from. Ah, Lansing individual, good, because we're um, kind of um, gearing this towards folks living in East Lansing a little bit. So glad to have you, Bryce. We'll get started in a minute here. If you have questions during this webinar, there is a box called Q&A and pop your questions in that Q&A box. Um, the chat, you can just share um, thoughts with us, um, but if you have a very specific question, uh, get that in our Q&A. Angelo, you wanna pop on here? We'll introduce ourselves in a minute. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Angelo, I'm with the library. I will be monitoring the chat and the questions, so please feel free to Put any questions you have in the Q&A box, as Sarah just said, and um, share what you're thinking in the chat box if you feel like doing that. Uh, so we are going to present. I'll introduce myself, talk about myself a little bit here with you. Angelo is kind of our library behind the scenes guy. Um, we will be presenting for approximately an hour, maybe a tad shorter. Uh, we're going to be um, uh, uh, putting out a couple polls just to uh, gather a little bit of information about folks or maybe some of their experiences with gardening and gear. Um, and um, pop those questions in any time. We'll probably address most of those questions at the end of the webinar. I'll take a break kind of midway and maybe we can um, answer a couple questions for you at that time. Otherwise, I'll probably kind of plow through some of these um, tips for you. Um, but no worries, when we get to the end, we'll address some of those questions. All right, ready, Angelo? Oh, Alexa's there too. All right. So um, I am Sarah Raudio, Dr. Sarah Raudio. I work for MSU Extension, and I am a horticulturist here. Um, I do have a background in fisheries and wildlife. My PhD is in fisheries and wildlife but I've really transitioned in, in the recent past into horticulture, which is a bit of my passion and my love and my hobby. Um, so we're gonna focus on this webinar. We are recording this webinar, so it is something that you can come back to later um, if you wish, or it's something that you can share with other people that you know, it'll be available on our library website uh, after we do this live. Uh, so there will be ways that you can access this again and share it with others. Um, but as a MSU Extension um, educator, I'm involved with a program called Smart Gardening, and I, uh, I am a, um, the individual who uh, handles a lot of our questions about uh, problems in the garden with deer and, and other types of animals. Um, it's kind of in my specialty. I also work in our health group, so I do a lot of integrated programming that talks about um, all those health benefits of gardening, and if there's any gardeners in the audience right now, uh, you probably know what I'm talking about. It is a very therapeutic um, and amazing way to feel great both mentally and physically. Um, so it is a, um, a great passion of mine and many others for that reason. Um, so you'll find that today I'm going to be talking about deer, but my focus is going to be um, quite a bit on horticulture and plants. Um, and that is um, sometimes some new knowledge for folks. 
Um, as an MSU Extension employee, we just want to um, uh, remind people that we are an organization that's open to all. Um, so I'd like to start with that. But before we get going today, um, Angelo and I would just like to ask you a few questions about yourself. Just a couple questions about um, you and how you found out about this webinar. So he's going to um, just share a poll right now. And if you can take a moment and answer that poll for us, that would be great. So we'll give you a couple minutes there. Um, there are two questions on this um, first poll. If you can answer both of those for us. And we'll give you a minute there. I know when I teach and I pull the polls up, it's kind of a, a way to remind people to, to um, engage in case they were wanting to grab a, a, a glass or something to drink or whatever. We're still here, come on back, we have a poll. So mm -hmm. we'll give you another, another few seconds here. Um, Anne was at, Anna was asking, she's not getting any polls. She's not seeing the poll. Hmm. Um, have you uh, try putting your Zoom in full screen? If it's not on full screen, that might help. Um, we do have some respondents, so should be displaying. And don't worry, um, we certainly, um, don't expect everyone to be able to answer, but um, yeah, take a look and see if you're not in full screen. Okay, sorry about that, Anna. So, Anna, you're more than welcome um, to share some of the answers to our questions in the chat. Um, so when we get to our next poll, um, you can read those questions off Angela so she can share those in the, in the chat. All right, so we'll go on to a second poll that we have just to find out um, how you um, learned about this webinar. And there's two questions on this poll too, if you can just let us know how you found out about this event. Uh, we're always curious to know um, how we reach people. This might be something, Angela, we can share with everybody just to get a feel for um, where folks are coming from. And thank you, Anna, for sharing that in the chat. She, she um, uh, provided that answer there. So the questions are, have you ever attended a Peace Lansing Public Library or MSU Extension event in the past? And um, how'd you hear about our event? Um, like, did you see it on social media? Did you see it on a web page? Okay, we're probably good with that, Angela. If you want to share that with everybody, if you didn't get a chance to vote, no worries. We'll pull another poll up in a little while and um, during the webinar. So there you go. We have um, kind of a mixed group here, but it sounds like most of them heard through the li uh, library website, Angela. So looks like we have um, some great communication through that website. So. Okay, so I'm going to get moving here, um, and I, I was inspired a little bit by Angela at the library on how to start this conversation with deer, and obviously this is not a deer, this is a groundhog, um, which is another animal that bothers people's um, gardens, but I, I like to bring it up because I like to share a little bit of perspective at the beginning. Um, so this animal, um, when I was first um, talking a little bit with Angelo, he saw this slide and he said, what is that? Um, that is a wombat, and a wombat is an Australian animal in the marsupial family um, that actually has very similar characteristics as a groundhog in that it's a digger and it makes tunnels, you know, and it kind of gets farmers and gardeners a little angry 
Um, but somehow or another, I think when Americans see a picture of a wombat, um, we almost want to pick it up and hug it. And it's just because it's so interesting to us and it's so kind of unique. And, and it just goes to show that we all live in different parts of the world and what might seem um, like a pest to some of us in one place might not be um, a pest from another person's perspective. But, but what we find is where we live, as, as some of these cute guys start doing things to our gardens or impacting our lives, then maybe we lose that a little bit of that affection at times. But just kind of a reminder that some of it is all perspective in, in that, um, how we view those animals. And there's a whole slew of, of I sometimes say, furry friends that, that impact um, our yards and our gardens and our lives. And they all have a bit of varying degrees on how they impact us and how we feel about individuals. Yeah, if you're wondering, that guy in the bottom, that is an albino um, porcupine. Um, I uh, display in a museum, but whether it's a chipmunk or a vole or a or porcupine, they, they all can have an impact on our life. Um, when we think about where we live, um, this is a um, satellite image of East Lansing. And um, last time I presented, I showed a satellite image of, of Grand Rapids. And it kind of gives us a feel for where our natural areas run and, and how people have have um, developed um, communities where they live um, in what used to be natural environments. And so if we look on campus here, we can see that we have a little bit of greenery here along the Red Cedar River. Um, it's fairly uh, grayscale here around campus, but then as we move into our residential areas out here, um, we start to see a little bit more greenery. So when it comes to wildlife, they're looking for some of those natural areas and they're intermixed in the places that we live. So we often say that, that this is urban wildlife and, and a lot of these organisms are here to stay and they're here to interact with us. So when it, when it comes to, you know, how bad are some of these versus others, I, I have a little bit of a Richter scale on wildlife bothering our gardens and Again, it's a personal perspective, but I kind of put these guys down as what I would call minor offenders, and it's because of what they actually eat. You know, so these, these particular organisms, and chipmunks and the squirrels of the world, you know, their favorite item is nuts and seeds. They will get into plants. They will dig up bulbs and things like that in our gardens, um, but, but their favorite thing is nuts and seeds. So when I say, are they impacting our plants? maybe not as heavy as other things. Then you get into what I kind of call the middle ground offenders, but aren't they so cute? Um, the skunks and the, and the raccoons of the world that start to dig holes and get into things a little bit more. Um, again, I still put those in that moderate um, category because a skunk is not going to tear up your entire vegetable garden per se. It will dig those holes in the lawn and it's usually in search of something to eat in that lawn. So we have to deal with some of those holes. But oh, then we get to the major offenders, and no kidding, this is one of our major offenders as a rabbit, and ultimately what we'll talk about today is deer. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time before we start talking about the plants that work best with deer, talking about deer biology, because the more you understand about the animal that you're working with, the more you realize you know, how to work with them. And so deer um, have some interesting biology, which kind of lends itself to why they can be in what I call the major offender group. Um, this is a little bit dated map from 2010, but kind of shows what our deer density looks like across the state, uh, where the green areas are where the deer density is over 45 per square mile. And this varies from year to year, but generally speaking, this is um, fairly consistent of where the highest densities occur. And it's a lot of our farming areas. So some of you folks here that are on the Ingham County um, area, you know, we're surrounded by some pretty dense areas and even that yellow area is pretty high. There's parts of the UP not so much because um, of harsher conditions and less food resources. Um, so um, there are some steps you can take with gardening with any pest. Um, and I wanna run through those before I talk about that biology um, really quickly, is that really thinking first about what that severity of that problem is. This is a really big problem. What's your tolerance level? Some people are more tolerant of that damage than I am. But really understanding the enemy, and I, I, I would rather say acquaintance because we do share that space with them. Um, and um, 
um, then seeking permanent change for the long term versus temporary changes for the short term. And I'm, I'm going to explain this as we walk through these slides, is that there's two different ways of looking at this. You can do temporary changes and you can do more permanent changes. And the permanent ones are really the ones that are much more sustainable. So when, it's, when I talk about perspective, it's really saying whose side are you on. There's, um, there was an issue out in the northwest part of the country where some um, otters were devouring some quays out of a pond in a botanical garden. And there was a big controversy over in, I believe, and I'm sure it was Oregon or Washington. Um, and there were people on both sides of the issue, you know, some people saying it's just what otters do. And other folks saying, but these koi cost hundreds of dollars and, and you just went and ate it in one go. And, and so you can really understand the perspective from both sides, but it's really trying to say, you know, what is our tolerance level? In cases where it's a koi that was very expensive and very near and dear to our heart, that could be um, a bit traumatic. In other cases, maybe it's, it's not that big of an issue. Um, but, you know, it's, it's that perspective, thinking what is your perspective to begin with. And um, we'll see if you get any good ideas if your perspective is that you have a very low tolerance level, um, or maybe even th those who have a lot of tolerance levels say, hey, I actually have some tools to work with. So let's talk a little bit about um, what deer biology looks like um, to kind of give you an idea of why these can be such big pests to our gardens. So if you look at the um, morphology of deer and kind of how their jaws and their teeth are arranged, um, it, it really lends itself to what, what they do to plants. So they're not what we call um, shear grazers. And I'll, I'll show you a cow comparison because they don't have the same tooth structure as a cow. Um, instead, they have these back molars and these front and scissors that allow them to just yank plants out of, the, out of the ground while cows do a lot of shearing. And so if you look at those differences in their, in, in their teeth, this is a cow's um, jaw and tooth uh, arrangement, but this is a deer. So deer go and they grab with those front and scissors, they just yank something out of the garden, they stick it to the back of their mouth, they chomp it off, and lo and behold, they stick it in a four-chambered stomach, just like a cow, which means they can eat a lot of different things. If they were like cows, we'd love deer, because all they do is come and cut our grass for us, but guess what? They have those different jaw structures in their bone. And so if you drive around, this is from Tower City, where I'm from, um, there's not a whole lot going on in that yard, and not to mention this is the middle of the day. So deer have done a really, really wonderful job of um, um, acclimatizing to our environment and getting very used to us being around. I can literally drive right up to these guys, and I'm sure some people in some urban areas um, have that experience. So I, I just want everybody to share um, just a little bit of information before I dive into some of these um, tools of what you've already tried in your gardens to deter deer. So Angela, I'll have you um, pop that poll up. Just share with us some of the things that you've already done. And we can share that back with everybody and hopefully you can get some um, newer ideas um, by the end of this. Now is that pause time as people are, are taking a look at that. So is it barriers? Is it repellents? You know, and you can pick more than one on here. It's it's not um, a one answer. It's you know select as many that you use just so we can see what some of the popular items are. I'll give you just a couple more seconds here and show everybody what we came up with so far. And just to share, Anna, who's not able to see the polls, um, she said the repellents. So she's tried the repellents. So, so it looks like a, a good chunk of you have tried barriers in deer resistant plants. So um, a smaller population um, saying scare tactics or none at all. And then repellents kind of falls there. We, we don't have a real large group today, only about 18 people participating. Um, but I would, I would um, reckon that this is a similar um, pattern even with a larger audience. So, all right, so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on what not to grow. I think the people participating today and future viewers are going to probably agree that, oh yeah, okay, this explains a lot, Sarah. 
there are some things to not grow. And it's a pretty large group of things, but I think you're going to be real surprised um, with some of the things that are a little bit more effective for um, deer resistance. And maybe those will be a surprise, maybe others you've tried. Um, feel free to share feedback with me anytime um, later on after the webinar. But what not to grow in the cedar arbovitae, um, they just love them. There's a reason why this is like sheared off at the level of where the deer can reach, is because these are some of their favorite plants. And what we struggle with is that a lot of the garden centers carry these kind of plants. And so the more you know, the wiser you can be as a shopper. Um, but unfortunately, these types of things are often in um, our garden centers, um, which makes that a little bit difficult because I think we all um, are challenged by deer uh, these days. You, another one, they just really enjoy you. And you may have a you that's made it for a while and then all of a sudden you look, you know, spring rolls around and you say, what happened? There's one just down this road from me that just was decimated just this year and it made it through many, many years without that. But if deer get hungry enough or if they're, you know, if they're moving around and they find something, they're, they're, they're very uh, casual eaters and they, they, they're sometimes unpredictable of when and how they're going to do it. But when they do, it can be um, pretty damaging. Hostas, that used to be a hosta on the left-hand side. Uh, I know people adore them, uh, but so do deer and so do rabbits. I often say anything that looks like it would be nice in a salad, uh, salad bowl, um, is probably something that deer is going to eat. And we'll get to some details on the types of characteristics they don't like in a leaf. But if it looks like it could be in a salad bowl, you're not going to have very good luck. Daylilies, they really love to chomp on those rabbits like those a lot too. A lot of the beautiful things that are going to start to bloom right now, deer just love. They love tulips. Um, they'll eat rhododendrons, and they eat roses, despite the thorns. You would think the thorns would be a bit of a deterrent. They're not. They really, really like the roses. Um, newly planted annuals can be very susceptible. Um, think back to that jaw, and that jaw showed you that ability they have to take that um, um, front of their jaw and just pluck something right out of the garden. So it's no surprise when you see um, this kind of thing happening in a landscape um, where they're just coming in and plucking off what they want. Um, fruit trees and many deciduous trees. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking today about the trees and bushes that deer avoid. Generally speaking, the more that you can stick to some of the native varieties of those, the better off you're going to be. And fruit trees really need to be protected earlier. And of course, they rub on trunks, so you may experience that from time to time. Um, so what I'm going to suggest is that you really make smart plant choices, and it sounds like some of the audience has. Um, and really focus on those and try to get yourself to step away from the ones that they do eat. It's, it's a transition that we have to go through, but, but it can be um, very worthwhile in the long run. Um, and then just realizing that there are a lot of other things that you may not realize that they can be avoid. Um, hungry enough, a deer will eat just about anything. I don't always want to be the person to guarantee they won't do that. But there are things that they would prefer less than others. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these landscaping ideas to um, what we say, sometimes say swamp the predator of them. Um, and if you really do have a favorite rose or you really want to grow those annuals that they have typically bought it, get it in containers away from them. Okay, so here's a general guideline you can use without knowing every plant under the sun that a deer wouldn't go to. And walking around with your list in a garden center. Just remember these kind of things. If it's smelly, they tend to not like it. When I say smelly, I'm not talking about rose, like good smelly. I'm talking about kind of a strong smell. And some of us might love some of those strong smells. Others may kind of go, ooh, I am just not a rosemary person. Um, fuzzy and leathery, these are like opposites. But remember, if it's fuzzy or if it's got a leathery feel, they don't really like that. They've got that little like um, um, feeding particularity like we sometimes do with texture. And they're not big fans, grass-like. They're not a big fan of anything with grass-like foliage. And um, obviously toxic, um, I'm not advocating to go out and poison deer, but they're pretty smart to know that things are not going to um, go over well. So um, going back to that rosemary idea is that lavender is another amazing plant to plant when you have deer issues. Um, it's a smelly plant that's not so bad. And any of the woody herbs, any of the woody herbs with strong scents, um, and some of the woody herbs that we even plant on a 
for annual kind of flower reasons are pretty, pretty dearly assisted. And when you think about how to landscape with these, think about this en masse um, option. You know, we'll, we might go to a garden and say just buy one, but maybe it's your whole front walkway in front of your sidewalk or, or um, the community garden. You could border that whole community garden with lavender. I mean, that, that is just a nice border. To, to, it's not necessarily going to keep deer away from maybe something else, but they're certainly not going to bother that lavender. So any of those woody herbs are very, very deer resistant, and I'll leave those alone. Here's some sage just bordering the vegetable garden. Again, it's not going to stop the deer from jumping over and getting to that lettuce, but in terms of just landscaping with plants, there's, just, there's some amazing things you can do with the woody herb family um, to deter deer. Chives and garlic borders. Um, you know, I do an ornamental vegetable uh, talk at times where I talk about, yeah, you can grow them to eat, but you can grow them for landscaping purposes too. They fall into a category called ornamental alliums, and there's just hundreds of varieties of these worldwide. Um, some of these get planted in the fall, other ones are, are more perennial, like that you can purchase in the spring. But there's these flowers that stink too. Yarrow, yeah, I know not everybody's a fan of that, but there's many types of flowers that stink. Um, the Artemisia family is, is pretty interesting, but a stinky family. Um, and then the mint family. Um, the sage family, I'm um, going back to herbs, has an incredible diversity of flowering sages that are used for flowering purposes. And again, think about maybe some landscape designs that intermix the different colors of these stinky plants. Yeah, one single yarrow might not be that fantastic, but if you were to pull in a lot of different colors of them and different types of these deer resistant plants, and you know, there's just some um, pretty things you can do. Let's move to that fuzzy leathery category. And I'll explain fuzzy and with a few pictures a little bit more because it's not just the, the, the soft fuzzy leaves, but it might be the prickly stems or things like that. But, Poppies, there's a reason why poppies grow out in the middle of fields and ditches along farmland where deer are hanging out. Um, dusty millers have that really uh, fuzzy feel to them. So let's, let's talk fuzzy. This is a, a kind of an aerial shot of a herb called borage, one of my favorites. And if you look up close, it's got all these little fuzzy prickly things on the stems. If you're shopping and you find a plant like that, and these are really easy to grow from seed, um, those are incredibly deer resistant. Echinacea is in black eyed seasons. That's why they make it through deer issues because they not only have pokey things in their flowers, but they have fuzziness along their, their leaves and stems too. But the true fuzzy ones are coming from some of these plants um, like lamb's ear, and this is a sage actually. Um, this one right here, mullen, is, is really a bit of a weed in that it spreads a bit. But over in Europe, they actually use it, those varieties of mulling um, as, as center displays in their flower garden. Be a little careful here um, and break those seed heads off because they can spread a bit. But still, you know, um, these are not the things that deer are coming to very much, these fuzzy leaf things. They'll go over to these daylilies and these roses, but I don't know if these protect them here. Um, but they leave those around. Leathery, leathery. There's a, plant called a Virginia with a really leathery leaf. All of the sedums, there's a huge variety of sedums, whether they are tall ones or the ground covers that deer don't like. Um, peonies, I have to tell you, again, a, a plant that grows out in open lawn areas of farm country where there's deer running around and sometimes they bug the flowers and but they'll leave them alone for the most part. And if you get really adventurous, I do this myself, it's just you know, you get your pots out on the driveway that the deer can get to. You know, you can kind of go really at the other end and get some spiny aloe. This is aloe spinous sesima, and this could do some damage to pets of it. I suppose if they took a bite, so be careful. But, you know, trust me, I stick these out by the end of my driveway and the deer don't get in them. Now, these are agave in pots and things like that. You certainly have to bring them in for the winter, but but they'll be a little deer proof for you. You know, the grass-like ones, oh, there's all kinds of ornamental grasses that deer will leave alone. Lots of varieties of that. Here's a blue oat um, version. Um, then there's the poisonous category. Um, daffodils, crown imperials. It's not just daffodils. A lot of people know daffodils are deer resistant, but 
Um, there are many other bulbs too. Um, another um, bulb like plaid, caladium, um, is, um, has, produces a particular substance that is, is um, poisonous and it's related to skunk cabbage. I'm gonna show you a couple of pictures and somebody's gonna go, skunk cabbage, are you serious? And like, oh, what do you see? Um, buttercups, and then I'll show you a couple of pictures of castor beans. These are things that produce um, toxins that if the deer were to eat, it, they wouldn't do very well. So um, they've kind of learned that over the years of being deer. Um, so here is our caladium um, tuber, for example, that um, for those of you familiar with those, they go really well in shade and, and produce um, some fabulous colors. They're part of a family called the Rossii that produce these really incredible um, inflorescences uh, right here. And that really shows how it's related to skunk cabbage. This is um, skunk cabbage in a formal garden in France. And, and so, you know, Europeans um, have been landscaping now with skunk cabbage um, uh, quite a bit. Here is a formal garden in um, the UK, in Windsor, um, England. This is at Seville Garden. And this is a border on skunk cabbage along a the creek there and surrounded by all types of other flowering things. But, but um, we have native skunk cabbage here in Michigan. I know it's not for everybody. Um, back to those um, caladium, which are related to skunk cabbage, um, a bit deer resistant, so something to put in the shade. Here's um, the castor bean plant, which are quite stately and make really amazing set of pieces. This is at, over at University of Wisconsin in, in Madison, um, their botanical garden over there. If you get close up on the flowers, they're really um, quite interesting. So the deer leave these on. So another great thing. There are some vegetables deer will stay away from, and again, it's about that fuzziness, um, or it's a hot pepper issue. You know, but, but any of these um, vegetables that have these fuzzy stems, like watermelon and coops and stuff, um, those are the ones you can take a little chance of. Maybe not when they're little, because they can get plucked out, or the rabbits can get on them a little bit. But once they get larger, um, they withstand a little bit of damage. We all know rhubarb, another one of those plants that just kind of sits out um, in the middle of these fields and never gets eaten. Nasturtiums, I almost need to take this off there because they, the deer ate my nasturtiums last year. So I, I'm feeling like I can't really keep that there. So Angelo, maybe we can take a question right now and then um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the other um, things like repellents and barriers in a minute. Yeah, just a reminder, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A or if the, oh, we have one from Anna right now that's, uh, for the poisonous plants, are they harmful to birds? Um, not necessarily, but it's always good to check on every individual plant. Um, birds are pretty smart about knowing what they can go to, too. So, so the ones I featured, birds are not really harvesting anything from those types of plants, um, so you probably don't have to worry about that. Okay, any more, Angela? Uh, there are not any more right now. Okay. All right, so as I move into these other areas of how to deter deer, um, it kind of falls into our category at Michigan State that we, we have a name for this. It's called integrated pest management. And it's all about that integration. It's about the idea that when you're working with a pest, whether it's an insect um, or a fun fungi, maybe affecting your plant, but even deer and animals, is that the best approach is a very integrated approach. You know, it's trying to really understand when the problem occurs, why it's occurring, um, and then taking kind of that integrated approach to figure out how to deal with it. Um, we have a great website, and on that website, there is a, a category called wildlife management. You can go check that out a little bit too. But as I'm walking into these other methods of deterring deer, Think about that integrated idea is that, you know, you can do these things, but you're going to be most successful doing multiple things and taking kind of that integrated approach. Um, so I'm going to um, highlight a little bit of one particular type of plant for summer bulbs um, because I want to bring those two pieces together. And I want to say, start by planting bulbs that the deer avoid. In other words, stop planting tulips, start planting some of the other types of bulbs. But maybe you think too about the way that you design that. Transition away from that, what I call a buffet style to a buffer design. And that's just kind of something I made up recently 
um, and I'll be publishing an article on this in the next week or two, so look for that. Um, but this is what I would call a buffet style garden. And what I mean by that is, um, in, in, in defense of golf courses, they, they're a little restrictive, but let's say this is a, a new yard is that there is nothing here blocking anything from walking up to this nice little buffet. And so in this buffet, there may be some things like hostas that are just waiting there to be eaten. So there's very easy access, but not only that, but there's very limited options, except what's on the buffet table. And we don't have a whole lot of research really showing, you know, how do, how do deer behave differently when we have a buffet versus um, a buffer way of doing things. Um, but it'll be really interesting over the years um, to see how those compare. Because when it comes to animals and what they need, they're very dependent on a certain amount of food. It's kind of that predator-prey relationship. So there is this concept in ecology called swamping the predator. And this is a little like contrast to the last slide, but it's one of my favorite slides that I show, is that sometimes when you have so much available, there's only so much that's going to go eaten. And many of those items might not even be touched because they're deer resistant types of plants. So if for some people, they're comfortable with transitioning over to a little bit busier look to the way that they garden, you may find in the long run that we've swamped that predator out just a tap. Maybe we find out otherwise, but it, it's worth um, looking into, and it has to happen maybe at a little bit more of a regional level outside of one single yard, but maybe it's something to think about. Here's a couple other examples of just swapping the predator. There's a point, you know, where there's enough there, and it's not going to make much difference um, if a deer ate a certain piece of that. I was in a garden in France once, and there was a rabbit behind the speaker, and he said, Oh, I don't mind the rabbit there, I got enough for him. Um, and that, that's a little bit of attitude, but it's also a little bit of ecology too, and that, that rabbit can only eat so much, and of course he had a cat around the corner that was being chased him around. But there are ways to guard in that, that really has to do more with filling in areas, you know, bringing in a lot of different plants, a lot of diversity, and, and, and a lot more plants besides just a lawn. Right? But again, your circumstances vary, and some people need lawns for other reasons. Here's an example of just a filled landscape of deer-resistant plants. These are, these are alien bulbs that are grown more as perennials. It's a variety that, that has foliage year-round, plant intermingled with ornamental grasses. Um, these are both deer-resistant plants that are planted in larger amounts. This is one of my favorite views. Um, this is very exclusive to, the, to June, and I'm going to end today showing a nice video of this. But, these are all deer-resistant plants right here. These are irises, alliums, salvia, and nepidar on catmint. All, they all fall in those categories I talked about of leathery leaves, stinky smells, stinky smells, fuzzy leaves, um, things like that that the deer really don't like. And there's a lot of them there. There's not going to probably be a whole lot of deer damage to something like that. These are called poker plants, and they are also a bit deer resistant because they have a grassy-like uh, foliage to them. Um, and intermixed with maybe some other deer resistant plants, there's some poppies down here, um, that may be an effective type of thing. But again, kind of in a prairie look, um, not just a single species. This is another bulb I feature in the article coming up called Aramis, um, and these are foxtail lilies. These are not growing a lot in the U.S., mostly in Europe. Um, they have these incredible types of um, tubers that are quite interesting. So, um, gladiolus, another type of plant that goes out in open farmlands that the deer tend to leave alone because of that grass like foliage, those could be intermixed in borders. This is something called um, agapanthus, um, another bulb type plant that can be grown in containers. But the deer tend to leave not because it's got a smell like allium, but because it has these leathery um, like leaves. If you look really close at a begonia plant, look at the fuzziness on that, this begonia plant. This happens to be a species that is incredibly fuzzy, um, but for those of you who shot for Rex begonias as annuals in, in Michigan, um, those are fuzzy types of plants that, that if you get um, quite a few of them growing, may withstand a little bit of investigation, but um, weather quite well. So. Um, so 
more in, the, in now moving to what I would refer to as the temporary solutions. I'm coming out of what I call the permanent solutions of modifying landscapes to adapt to the deer being there. But temporary solutions are temporary. And that's where repellents fall, is that this is a temporary way of keeping that animal off your plant. And, and it has to be repeated because weather and rain and things and that those repellents wear off. But I'll talk just briefly about some of these other techniques. And um, they fall into either a category of the bad case food, bad sense, or they can be kind of these scare tactics. If you look at the ingredients of the repellents, they're um, often quite natural. They're rotten eggs or putrid egg salads. Um, they come from pepper plants or garlic and things like that. So you really can make some of these in a homemade level. Um, here's somebody's um, um, soap bar hanging. And they, you know, there's things people have tried. They don't like um, human body odor and predator urine because they've kind of been conditioned to know that those are predators. People try to hang their, their stinky t-shirts sometimes out there and some of those repellents are made of coyote urine. Somebody asked me once if human urine works as well and I, wasn't quite sure if that's the case, but I um, warned them to be a little careful with the urine because there's a lot of salt in the urine. Temporary solutions, again, you could do these like noisemakers, water, motion detector water techniques. If you go online, I'm sure you can find a lot of, a lot of different kinds of um, ways. A pet that spends outdoors um, can be quite a, a great deterrent and until the poor pet's not around again, you know, and then, then you have to try something else. Middle ground solutions are blocking types of things like enclosed structures, fences, electric options. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the fencing options. I know places like East Lansing um, are a little restricted in what they can do. You know, um, in areas where you can grow, um, put in bigger fences, there's tensile types of fences. This is obviously not spaced well for a deer, but just kind of showing what we mean by, by um, uh, the tensile types of fences. Ideally for a deer, you need mesh, meshes that they can't get through. Um, and this helps with rabbits too. So using mesh on your fence um, is really ideal with deer and rabbits. This is one of our, my colleagues, Ben Phillips, who works in field preps. This is his current deer fence right here. And the coloring is not great to see, but you have to have it at a minimum eight foot level uh, for the deer to not get in. He's also buried some chicken wire under the ground to deal with the woodchucks. So it can be a pretty big endeavor to put that deer fence in, but it really is probably one of the best things that you can do um, for preventing deer from getting to it in the first place and works a little bit better than the repellents. Um, but in city areas, you might need to go with some of, with some of these resin um, or vinyl type options if the city allows that. Um, to keep deer out of your garden. So that could be an option too. Um, at a local level, at a much smaller, smaller level, if you just have individual plants um, or parts in your vegetable garden that you're trying to protect, um, one of the things that deer don't like are a lot of things bumping into their faces. And this is not necessarily totally deer proof. This is a natural design that just has a lot of different branches in the way. And they, they, they get a little spooked by that. Uh, an artificial way of doing that is taking fishing line and running some stakes around that plant and just doing some zigzag patterns to fishing line um, because they'll hit that fishing line and it spooks them enough that they don't like that. There's some temporary solutions of using some mesh or chicken wire types of setups to cover things, especially while they're young. And if you're looking for something more permanent and fancy is when you start to look at the some of these miniature greenhouse setups, or even a greenhouse itself, um, um, what, at whatever scale, just as long as you've got some aeration ability. This may be your longer term way of gardening in the city and, and talk about um, really a nice aesthetic thing even to add to your house or to your yard. You know, in the country, we have a little bit more space to go in hoop houses and high tunnels. Um, and here's this year's auction on my, on my um, property is that I am during quarantine now staying at my um, boyfriend's house and he does not have a deer proof yard. So he said, well, I'm gonna order you some of these um, um, smaller containers and I'm going to go on the deck. So this is um, a planting container that I have elevated on the deck. And then of course I've got my little um, recycled child uh, safety um, uh, thing, um, gate there that I can put 
I don't really think the deer are going to walk the stairs up or up onto my deck, but we'll see if that, you know, I mean, that it's never, um, uh, it's always too, um, good to be safe inside, so we'll put the gate up too. I also have a little portable hoop house here that I'll cover in clothes and keep some things in there. So there are all these kind of small scale options um, that you can use. So going back to my other garden, this is at my house now, is even though I got this really amazing fence here, I don't have one in the front. So guess what? The deer come here. But I have had very successful vegetable gardens despite deer visits. And that is because in this garden, I grow my pumpkins and my squashes and the, the plants that they leave alone. If I do put a plant in there that they bother, I make a small scale covering to that plant and keep it in that small covering. And then, of course, I, uh, you know, surround my garden with these beautiful um, Spinosema um, aloes. I really do grow these. I bring them in for the winter. Um, and they leave those alone, too. So when it comes to these guys getting in there, hey, oh, I'm protected. So um, fruit trees, if you are growing trees, just think about um, some of that trunk protection um, from the rubbing and from them destroying those fruit trees, um, especially when they're young. As they get older, you may have um, some ability to take some of that deer damage. So. so with that, I'll have Angelo kind of just pull up our last poll to see if you picked up any good tips here. And then we'll um, take some time for questions. So. Are you there, Angela? Yeah, I just launched the, the last poll. Oh, we also okay. we do have a, a question and a comment. Do you want me to move into those now, or do you want to wait until the... Well, if you don't have a lot of questions, I'll go ahead and take those while people are taking the poll. And um, sure. I just had a couple um, small pieces of information to share uh, before we leave today. Yeah, so I think you already covered this one, but I wanted to give you a chance to speak more to it if there was more to say about it. Someone asked if there was any natural deer repellent. Um, I like that DO is a deer repellent, but if you have more to, to comment about that, that is a question we got from someone in the audience. Well, again, you can, when, I, I'm not sure what they meant by natural, but it, could it, is it something that you can make from a food or something that you have at home? Um, and so certainly um, putting something like um, um, hot pepper uh, flakes or, or um, maybe some cayenne pepper, sprinkling that on things, um, um, making some sort of a, a extract of, of garlic um, that you could spray on. Um, you can certainly make some of those homemade things yourself. Um, again, I just want to remind people that they are a bit temporary. However, if it does protect something, maybe while it's small, until it gets a little larger and can take a little bit of that browsing, um, that certainly is a nice thing to add. Um, or it's a nice, like going back to that integrated approach, you know, it just may be an extra feature that you have. Um, let's say you do have a deer resistant plant and you're nibbling it on a bit, you know, maybe it comes in handy as just spring um, temporarily to, to kind of steer them away from that. And then um, we had another uh, comment that uh, from Anne that several years ago a, do a deer challenged her dogs. They barked, <laughs> at, <laughs> they barked at the deer on the other side of the fence and the deer just stomped at them. So I don't know yeah. if you want to speak a little bit to do the relationship between dogs and deer or have any comments. Well, and I don't know what dog species they have. So it, you know, it depends on, on you know, what type of dog that is. But I have to tell you that I, it's just been my observation, and maybe wildlife biologists can share this too, is that deer have become increasingly more comfortable with the other animals and people that they're around. Um, and that they, they have lost a bit of that fear factor. Um, and it may be that they, they start to become familiar with the fact that those dogs are on the other side of a fence. Um, where I live, my deer had free range. So, um, they didn't come near her. And she was a corgi and she was very small. So um, it wasn't necessarily that she was a scary dog, but she certainly could run at them. So um, I, I think they're smart enough sometimes to figure those things out. And then um, we had another question, uh, I think that relates to repellents. Um, is human hair a, a repellent? 
Yeah, I've had that one asked too. And I think anything that smells like a human could potentially be um, a repellent to the deer. I don't know that that hair has a strong enough scent for a deer as opposed to you know a predator urine, for example, um, because that's meant for marking and it, it has that concentrated smell. I'm not quite sure hair has that. Um, people try a lot of different things, and I always say if it's no skin off your back um, or no hair off your head, uh, you can try it. Um, again, I, I don't always think it's great for a permanent solution, but, but possibly a, a temporary one you can give it a chance. And then I just have a quick housekeeping announcement. Someone asked if this uh, webinar will be online. The answer is yes. Um, so we'll, we'll provide people with that link and then if you want to throw your email in there I'll try to keep track of that and, and follow up with people on that and then we have another question um, for a rectangular vegetable garden would it be advantageous to position deterrent plants such as squashes peppers etc towards the outside and tomatoes and other yummy deer plants towards the middle um yes and no um they they will climb over to get to what they want um, however, you, because you're growing tomatoes, usually with a tomato cage, it's pretty easy to surround that tomato with a bit of chicken wire. And as the tomato plant gets larger, there'll be less of a need to block it. But, it, but when it's young, put that tomato cage on it, cover it with chicken wire, and once it gets nice and robust, it will probably be able to withstand a, a little bit of munching. Certainly those fuzzier ones on the outside might deter them a little bit, but, but not really. Um, it's more that those plants are protected themselves a little bit more. And then we have a, another question about uh, wild turkeys. So uh, it looks like wild turkeys are an issue for this person. Um, and is there anything special that you could recommend to keep them out of their garden? Well, I'm not exactly sure if it, what type of damage they would be causing, if it's more just a nuisance to have them in there. Um, so it really depends on, on why they're there. Um, so if they're stepping on things or, or uh, that's a problem, then you would have to block it. Um, I don't know how well the repellents really work on turkeys. Um, maybe some of the scare techniques, you could try those. Um, but otherwise, they're not plant eaters per se, they're not eating your vegetables um, necessarily, so um, some of those repellents we would use against a rabbit might not be that effective. Eating tomatoes, yeah, they'll go more for the fruit, right. In fact, I've, I, I have a great picture of a turtle eating a, a tomato, so, um, so it might not be the plant material, but they might be going after the tomatoes. And what I would say is if you know that that's the time when they're going to be a problem is when the tomatoes are ripening, that it goes back to our integrated pest management is that's the time to maybe run a, a row cover or something over the top of that as they're maturing. So just keep a special eye on it at that time and that's the time to, to be proactive in blocking it or covering it temporarily when you're not there to watch. Um, yeah, so just a couple more things it looks like. Uh, Anne is saying that the dogs that were challenging the deer are small dogs. <laughs> right. Although I'd say if the fence wasn't there, maybe they could still scare that deer away. And then uh, Sean says, thanks for all the tips. Happy gardening. Um, and it looks like the wild turkeys were eating this panelist's tomatoes. Um, and then we have a question, who would be eating my Cora Bells? Oh, uh, well, it's always, you know, that's the, the big question, who's, who's doing it? So coral bells are supposed to be a bit resistant. They're kind of moderately resistant um, to animal damage. Um, I would be most suspicious of deer or rabbits in your case. Um, kind of look at the, at the feeding patterns. And of course, I always say if it's really a problem and you, you're interested in a trail cam, that, that is one of the best ways of figuring out what it is, is with a trail cam. Um, but I'd be more suspicious of, of rabbits or, or deer. Even though they're a bit resistant, we will still go to them. And Angela, I'm going to have you share the results real quick of that poll. And then I just want to, unless there's another question, I, I just want to share a little bit more info from, for some of our resources at MSU. 
Yeah, you should be seeing the results to the poll now uh, on your screen. And then we have a comment. This was very helpful. Thank you. So as Sarah said, if there's any final questions, feel free to throw them in the chat and we can address those. So I'm just um, showing you a little screenshot of MSU Extension's um, main gardening page. If you just search gardening in Michigan, you can get to it. We have a lot of great resources um, and new ones right now because of stay at home policies. But um, Smart Gardening Group has lots of resources on vegetable gardening, pollinators, um, and lawns and things like that. We have some learning online tools. We have um, a vegetable gardening series that I co-host that's a self-paced series online right now. Um, if you have just individual questions, you can link them to this Ask an Expert website and send those in. Um, and then we have a Master Gardener program if folks get interested in something like that at a higher level. Here's just a little picture of we have a hotline that's manned by our staff and volunteers. It's Monday, Wednesday, Friday mornings right now. And they're not full time because we're a little understaffed. But um, that Ask an Expert website is a great place to submit a question too. And Angela, unless there are more questions, I want to see if I'm able to kind of run um, this video here of that one particular garden that shows all those deer resistant plants in mass because um, it is quite beautiful. So I'll just run that. And if there's any more questions, I'll take those before we end. Looks like we're good on questions. We got one final comment. Thanks for the good information. Um, so, yeah. These are the kind of things that make us feel good um, this time of year. <laughs> cool. All right, all set, Angela? I think we're good. Um, thanks for uh, the presentation. Learned a lot. Okay, and I will put um, very quickly my email in the chat box if anybody's still on and wants to grab that. Um, otherwise, this will be posted on the library's website in the future. Okay, thanks, Angelo. Looks like we um, kept within our time frame, too. Yeah, thank you. Everybody enjoy the, uh, the afternoon. Looks like it's supposed to be sunny for the rest of the day, at least here in the Lansing area. So. All right, yep, have a good day. Thank you.